dear brothers and sisters, dear members of the community. I feel blessed tonight that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated for all of us to gather on this blessed night. Tonight is the night of the 15th of Shaban. And what I'd like to do tonight is only to focus on one thing, which is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. First, I think we'll, we'll give some information about, general information that we're all familiar with, but it's good to remind ourselves of these information again. Uh, I thought we could focus on understanding the hadith that came from our Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam so that we can apply it if we can, and if not, it will help us for next year, inshallah. So, as you know, we are now in the, in the blessed season, the season of Rajab, Shaban, and Ramadan. Shaban is called the month of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In these months, the Qibla was changed from facing Jerusalem to facing Mecca. It took place about approximately two months prior to mid-Ramadan. So most likely it took place in Rajab. Uh, but there are some statements that it could also have taken place in Shaban. Less likely, but these positions are there. Uh, also, it was in the months of Shaban uh, that most likely the verse in Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi was revealed. Anyway. So, the month of Shaban is, is famous for um, we are told that our records are presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala periodically. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of what we do all the time. He looks at our hearts all the time. He scans our heart. Inna Allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum wa la ila amalikum wa lakin yanzuru ila kulubikum. Allah does not look at your forms or your power or your money or your fame or your material wealth, but He scans your heart. So we know that, but we're also told that periodically our records, our deeds are presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wouldn't you want your records to be clean when they're presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the universe? So we are told that our records are presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the months of Shaban as we will see in the hadith. But specifically, if we were talking about the middle Shaban, the 15th of Shaban, Nusuf Shaban, we have a hadith from Ahmed and al tabarani that Allah exalted as he descends to the nearest heaven in the middle night of Shaban and his forgiveness is greater than the number of hairs on the sheep in the tribe of Kalb. I.e. says in the hadith, Inna Allah yanzilu fi laylati nusfi min shaban fayaghfiru li aksara min shari bani Kalb. So imagine sheep and sheep are full of hair. Can you, these hair, are they countable or uncountable? The set of hair is an uncountable set. It's millions and millions and of hair. And it says in the hadith that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. His forgiveness is greater than the number of hairs on the sheep in the tribe of Kalb. 
every forgiveness has conditions attached to it. Uh, so, also in the the narrations by Imam Bayhaqi, it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala إِذَا كَانَ لَيْلَةٌ نُصْفِ مِنْ شَعْبَانٍ إِطَّلَعَ اللَّهُ إِلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ Actually, the narration started earlier. The narration started by with Sayyid Aisha narrating that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam بَاتَ عِنْدَهَا it was her turn. And alayhi salatu wasalam stayed with her the night. فَقَامَ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ يُصَلِّي So he started praying in the night. Then a Sayyidah Aisha says, فَسَجَدَ فَأَطَالَ السُّجُودِ He made sujood and he stayed in sujood for so long. Sayyidah Aisha got scared. She got worried that he passed away. Because he made sujood for such a long time. So she came near to him. فَسَمِعَتْهُ يَقُولُ أَعُوذُ بِعَفْوِكَ مِنْ عُقُوبَتِكَ While he was in prostration. أَعُوذُ بِعَفْوِكَ مِنْ عُقُوبَتِكَ وَبِرِضَاكَ مِنْ سَخَطِكَ وَبِكَ مِنْكَ لَا أُحْصِي سَنَاءً عَلَيْكَ أَنْتَ كَمَا أَسْنَيْتَ عَلَى نَفْسِكَ So when he finished his prayer, he told the Sayyid Aisha, أَتَدْرِينَ مَا هَذِهِ اللَّيْلَةِ Do you know what this night is about? قَالَتْ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَعْلَمَ Usually when the Prophet ﷺ asks something, even if you know what it is, you might think things have changed. You see, and it happened also in the time of Hajj many times when he asked them, what day is this? They know it's it's Eid al-Adha. They said, has the day changed? And then he kept asking them questions until they saw that things have changed and now he's going to name them differently or give them different names. She said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. He told her this is the night of the Mid-Sha'ban. And then Imam Bayhaqi narrated another hadith where it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the middle, in the night of middle of Sha'ban, اِطَّلَعَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ that Allah looks extensively at the hearts, at his servants. فَيَغْفِرُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ He forgives the believers. وَيَرْحَمُ الْمُسْتَرْحَمِينَ And he, he, uh, he gives his mercy to those that seek mercy. وَيُمْلِي لِلْكَافِرِينَ And postpones and delays those who are kafirs. I.e. they don't they're not eligible to receive this rahmah or this maghfirah. And then also it doesn't pay attention to those who have who harbors animosity in their hearts toward others until they leave their animosity. I have a question for you, inshallah, when we get to we'll, we'll pick one hadith and focus on it. And let's try to understand it together and see the beauty in it. Anyway. The other hadith is from Ibn Majah and Ibn Hibban. It's a hadith of Mu'az ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, who relates the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying that Allah looks at his creation during the middle night of Shaban. Allah looks at his creation all the time. But here the word usually this word in modern usage it's used to indicate extensive look. It's, you say after we've extensively looked in this at this matter this is our verdict. Like if you're in a business setting or in a court setting or in a legal setting and a lawyer or a judge is looking extensively at your case, and then says, after looking extensively at your case, this is the judgment. This is 
how we're going to rule. Or this is the best solution for all your accountant when you're doing your taxes. He says, after looking at your case, this is the best way to avoid paying taxes. So that's the word that is used. It's not just he looks, but look. It's, it's, there's an, it's an emphatic form. There's an emphasis that, uh, that your heart is scanned completely. No corner of the heart is, you can escape. Anything you have in the heart is revealed. And it's an extensive look to the point that everything is searched and everything is, is looked at. During the middle night of Shaban, and forgive them all. So if you're eligible, See, it's, the hadith is saying that your heart is going to be presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Shaban, our records are presented, but in the Nus of Shaban, our heart is presented. He's saying, Oh Allah, look at my heart. What does that mean? Would you show someone your house before, before cleaning the house? Would you show someone, would you invite people and the, your, your house is messy? Like my house is messy, but anyone else? Would you invite anyone before? No. So this requires that some preparation is done. So when we read this hadith, it's not a hadith that we should read on the Nusuf Shaban. It's a hadith we should have read a month earlier or two months earlier. And it's a hadith that we read now for next year. It's a hadith that we read for every night because no one knows when we're going to disappear and, and leave this world. So, and forgive them all, except an idolater, except a mushrik, and one who harbors rancor, one who harbors, one who has hatred in their heart. Now you might think, what's, what's common between these two? A mushrik? someone who has hatred why were they the two were mentioned in one hadith yeah can you give us some thought we'll come back to this point that's an important point because uh, it'll help us uh, in understanding the, the dimensions of this hadith The other hadith is a hadith from Musnad Ahmad. They all revolve around the same, the same manner, same matter. Uh, and it's a hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, radiyallahu anhuma, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said that Allah, majestic is he, looks at his creation on the middle night of Shaban and forgives all of his slaves. Save an, save an idolater and a murderer. A murderer is someone who has hatred toward one person and says, that's it, I'm going to accelerate the meeting between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and kills him. And so these are hadiths that we, that we read. Imam al-Nasai and his... Uh, in his Sunan, narrated on the authority of Usama bin Zayd radiallahu anhu, anhuma. And Usama is, uh, he was a young man, beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hibbu Rasulillah, it's called. Usama asked the Prophet a question. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I see you fasting in Ramadan, uh, in Shaban, more than any other month. And in other narrations, it, it is said that the Prophet Sallallahu used to fast in Shaban until we think that he, he'd never break his fast. And he used to break his fast in Shaban until we think that he'd never fast. And, and, and sometimes the Prophet Sallallahu would fast most of Shaban, most of Shaban, except a few, few days. So the, the Prophet ﷺ gave him two reasons as to why. 
she said, why would you fast this month more than any other month? Is there something special about this month? He said, That's the first reason. He said, this is a month that most people don't pay attention to. People pay attention to Rajab. It's one of the sacred months. And then they get busy preparing for Ramadan. And, and it just happens that sometimes Shaban just whoosh, zip by and all of a sudden we're in Ramadan. We're preparing for Ramadan. Ramadan is coming. So he says, Or sometimes people may neglect it. Maybe they know about it, but they may neglect it. Or they may, they may be completely unaware of, of Shaban. They're, they're in a state of heedlessness about Shaban. So he said, It's a month where people don't pay attention to uh, they, some of them are ignorant of, of this month. So there is like, this is an underlying principle here that, you know, it's easy to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. In Ramadan, it's easy. It's easy to do it in a mosque. It's easy to do it with people. But, when people are not doing it or are heedless and you do it, that means you're alert. It means you're attentive. It means even if people don't do it, you still do it. So even if people are heedless about this month, one is still aware and alert. It's all about focus. It's all about focus. You see, most of us have unfocused minds. Our mind is unfocused all the time. So even at, in college, when we teach students, uh, sometimes we we our audience is the unfocused mind. We want to help the students focus their mind, and it's all about at the end it becomes to it's all about paying attention. Can we get this person to pay attention? Can we get myself to pay attention to Shaban? And then the next step is, how much attention should I pay? Okay, I need to pay attention, but how much attention should I pay? So if, if one is aware of the importance of Shaban, and, and even if others are heedless, but at the same time, one still engages in, in, in Shaban, Alayhi salatu wasalam is talking about this. ذَلِكَ شَهْرٌ يَغْفُلُ النَّاسُ عَنْهُ That's the first reason. The second reason, وَإِنَّ الْأَعْمَالَ تُرْفَعُ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ And records are raised to Allah in this month. فَأُحِبُّ أَنْ يُرْفَعَ عَمَلِي وَأَنَا صَائِمٌ I love for my records to be presented before Allah while I'm in a state of fasting. Alayhi salatu wasalam says. Because fasting is also about um, it has dimensions, dimensions of Tawheed. So, this hadith shows the importance of Shaban as a whole. Now, Imam al-Shafi'i is reported to have said that it has reached me from previous scholars. Imam Shafi'i was born in the year 150, died in the year 204. So he lived only for 54 years. But he's in second century of Hijra. And he frequented the major scholars of his time, including Imam Malik, including Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani, the companion of Abu Hanifa, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, all the major uh, early Muslims. And he says, بَلَغَنِي أَنَّ هُنَاكَ خَمْسَ لَيَالِي يُسْتَجَابُ فِيهَا الدَّعْوَةِ it has reached me that there are five nights where uh, dua is uh, is likely to be answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The night of, of uh, Friday, the night of Eid al-Fitr, the night of Eid al-Adha, the night of Mid al-Sha'ban, Nusuf Sha'ban, 
and the night of the first of Rajab. And then he says that I also find it favorably to to make dua in those uh, five nights. So also his uh, independent judgment and and uh, uh, he also reached the same conclusion. However, you know, as we all know, dua has prerequisites and has conditions. Because dua is to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are guaranteed that our dua is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but provided that we fulfill the conditions of dua. And if we fulfill the conditions of dua, then our dua will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the hadith it is mentioned that Rubba Ash'as Akbar, perhaps a person who is disheveled and and is in distress and agony, raising his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking him and making dua. And then Prophet Sallallahu says, Sa'anna yustajabu lahu, how could his prayer be answered while his income is haram and his food is haram and his food is haram? So dua has a prerequisite. So one of the prerequisites of dua is to say sorry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before you ask somebody something, and if you have wronged this person in one way or another, well, the, the first thing one needs to say is sorry. Say, I apologize. I'm sorry for what I've done. In religious terms, sorry means tawbah. Oh Allah, I repent. That's what sorry means. Oh Allah, I repent to you. Oh Allah, I acknowledge my mistakes. I acknowledge my shortcomings. I acknowledge my sins. And I have made a firm intention to, uh, I regret them, and I promise not to do them again. So that's one of the prerequisites of dua, uh, is to declare one's tawbah. Tawbah cleans your, and if you, inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin, Allah loves those who turn back to him. So if one fulfills the conditions of dua, and then our dua is likely to be accepted. So uh, this requires some preparation. Requires some pre requires a plan that we we have thought about it, and I want my dua to be accepted in Nusuf Shaban, and I'm ready for it. I'm ready for my heart to be presented. I.e., I vacuum cleaned my heart, you know. <laughs> vacuum rearranged the furniture, and you know. oh, Allah, come and visit me anytime. I'm ready. I'm ready. So that's uh, uh, yeah. So that's, those are the hadiths that are related to um, to the months of Shaban and to Nus of Shaban. However, if we were to look at the hadith again. Inna Allah yattali'u ala al-ibad. Allah looks upon the servants, looks upon the creation. And he forgives the believers. Except two things, except two people, two kinds of people. Mushriks and those who harbors animosity toward others. Why is that? Can you help me understand the hadith? What's so special about those two people? Brother Zahir is going to attack. Just your thoughts. We can make all the mistakes here as long as we don't make them outside. Yeah? This is a safe, safe space. It's a safe space. Uh, he said, because a mushrik is one who associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, okay, so what? That's the next question. So what? Yes, go ahead. Want to help? I was going to say, like, yeah, so mushrik is someone who associates partners, and then someone who harbors animosity is almost, it's like almost as if they're associating themselves as a partner, as in they're showing that they have the right to be angry at someone when that's God's job. Or if, or like that's, that's between God and them. So 
Okay, all right, all right. Good. Yes. Mm, okay. Interesting. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts, sisters? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Good. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. How is that? Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Okay. That's very good. Yes. Because you have it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. You can have hatred for the sake of Allah, but not hatred for because you hate that person. Like, <laughs> yes, that's that's now yourself, your nafis. But if somebody commits sin, or somebody is, yeah, like yeah, in our religion we. We hate the sin. As in the surah, it says, إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحٌ عَمَلْ آلِ uh, But if one was to hate a person, uh, it needs to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They've done something that... Uh, and as, But if your hatred is true and sincere, i.e. if they were to change their behavior, you would also change. That's, uh, sincerity is a, is a very tricky thing. Yes, one more. I would say this situation, if someone, if someone does something bad to you, right? Mm -hmm. And they ask for forgiveness, and you, you, you forgive them, but you still have, you still have that hatred, that animosity, right? You don't, you don't forget, but you still have that hatred still, mm. right? Your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, your in-laws, mm. You see, the, the think about it in, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Take, for example, Khalid ibn Walid, Sayyiduna Khalid. There is no house amongst the Muhajirin and the Ansar that Khalid ibn Walid did not kill a family member of that house. He killed. Like, he was, he was, and he never lost a war, this person. He was one of, of three people in history that never lost a war in his life. As soon as he became Muslim, they embraced him like a brother. And all the hatred disappears. Why? Because it wasn't hatred for the self. Can we be like that? That's difficult. <laughs> That's very difficult. Yes. Yes, of course. Yeah, it's not the same. No, no. So be, being mad is is uh, is a reaction. When you get mad, is a reaction. So the Sharia doesn't have rulings on feelings and emotions. Have rulings on guidelines for feelings and emotions. I.e., before you get into that state, and after you get in that into that state. Hmm? So, for example, if somebody dies, somebody very close to me dies, and I feel sad, that's, the Sharia allows that, right? But if it goes to extreme, Sharia puts a guideline. Like, don't wail, don't scream, don't do this. Because normal feelings that every human being can have is uh, sanctioned by the Sharia. But the consequences of those feelings is where the Sharia puts limits on. And also, don't put yourself in a situation where, you know, I would get mad. 
and get angry. So there are guidelines before and after. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, "Inna man the strong man is not someone who can beat another man. But a shadidu man yamliku nafsahu and al ghadab. A strong man is someone who can restrain himself or herself when they're angry, when they fall. You have to channel your anger in the proper way. Because anger reflects a pain. There's a pain somewhere, and you're manifesting that pain in the form of an anger. Or sometimes it, it, it reflects an inability to communicate. When you don't know how to communicate, you get angry and you get mad and you start throwing a tantrum and, and all these things. And it reflects a little bit of self-insecurities. If someone has high self-esteem, Usually people who have high self-esteem know how to communicate. Communicate their thoughts, they know how to deal with people and manage people. If one has low self-esteem, which can be changed, yeah, and everything can be worked on. We can always become better than what we are today. But let's go back to the head. Yes? So you're saying when you prolong anger, then it becomes hatred. Okay. Yeah. It's it settled in the heart now. It becomes, uh, uh, it, it finds home. Yeah, it finds a home there. Finds a home there. Okay. So, so the Hadith is saying both one who harbors animosity, not necessarily expressing it, but just kind of like has envy. So why do people have hatred? Like, why do people have, uh, you know, they fight with each other? Uh, and uh, yeah, it's one of four things. It's either power, or money, <laughs> or 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 yeah, or fame. Well, or, yeah, or, yeah, these. Yeah, exactly. There are four or five things that drives people to get mad at each other. Oh, he got it. He got the job. I didn't get it. He got he got the girl. I didn't get it. Huh? Right. So let's let's back let's go back to the hadith. That in Allah yatliu al ibad. And he scans the heart, and he looks extensively at the heart. Imam Ghazali, in the Ihya, mentions that the statement of Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, is a statement about love. It's a statement about love. فيقول إن التلفظ بكلمتي الشهادة التزام للتوحيد. وشهادة بإفراد المعبود وشرط تمام الوفاء به ألا يبقى للموحد محبوب سوى الواحد الفرد He said شرط تمام الوفاء به So the conditions for fulfilling the Tawheed statement, the كلمة is that there should not remain in the heart of the one who says it anything except the one, the unique. I.e., you clean your heart, you vacuum your heart, and you say, oh Allah, there is nothing in my heart but you. But you. Why? Because al-mahabbatu la taqbalu shrika See, love doesn't accept partners. It does not. You tell your wife, I love you, but I love also someone else. She, you'll sleep on the couch tonight. You won't sleep. <laughs> you'll sleep outside in the snow if you're in Canada. Hmm? No. Love doesn't accept partners, partnership. And, uh, and to say Tawheed with, with the tongue only, uh, anybody can do it. Anyone can do it. But. When you declare your love, when you say, La ilaha illallah, in my heart there is nothing but Allah. So, you're going to be tested. The degree of love is going to be tested. 
And how you, how do you get tested? How do you get tested? So when you say I love somebody, love always um, imply that there have to be sacrifices. That there have to be, because you you tell a person if I can get your love, I'm willing to let go of coffee in the morning. I'm willing to let go of my car. I'm, I'm willing to let go of something, if I could only have your heart. You're willing to let go of something to get the heart of the beloved. Um, but you say, you know, I love you, but I'm not willing to sacrifice anything for you. Anyone can say that. So when I tell the students, what's the relationship between love and zakat? And they say, look at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> love and zakat. Because I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you. Do you love money more? Or do you love Allah more? Hmm? So when, you, when there is zakat, you trim your wealth a little bit, like you trim your trees in order to grow better. So you trim your wealth a little bit, and then the wealth will, will grow in a blessed way. So your love is going to be tested by your ability to let go and be separated from other things that you love. Hmm? People usually will prove their degree of love by talking about what they will sacrifice for that love. I love you more than I love X, Y, and Z. You want to get an iPhone, right? You want to get an iPhone. iPhone costs a thousand dollar. Well, which one do you love more, the iPhone or the thousand dollar? I love you more than the money I have in my pocket. I'm willing to pay it, to sacrifice that money to get this iPhone. I love you more. I want to get your heart, and in order to get your heart, I'm willing to sacrifice X, Y, and Z. I'm willing to sacrifice. You know, you name it. Whatever you love the most. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ You will not achieve birr until you spend of that which you love. So the word birr in Arabic has, uh, the meaning has multiple connotations. But there are two main connotations of birr. And for the same word birr is also used with parents. Birr will walidain. Birr toward the parents. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ i.e. the two main meanings of bir is rida and rahma. i.e. you will not achieve the rida of Allah, the pleasure of Allah, and the mercy of Allah until you spend of that which you love. Bir al walidain is the same thing. The pleasure of your parents with you as well as they always pray for you and they have mercy on you. Mercy of the mother is indescribable. So you get tested. So Sayyidun Umar spent, Abu Bakr spent all his money, Sayyidun Umar spent half of his money. One person spent the best horse he had. One person spent a well. He gave a well for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whenever we, de we declare, we make a categorical statement, you know, don't ever do that. But if you do that, you're going to be tested. You're going to, yes. Uh, Ramadan is an example of that. We, our love for Allah, for our love for Allah, we're sacrificing our food that we love, and we're sacrificing our relationship in the meal time. Mm -hmm. So we're sacrificing our love. So that's one of the ways that you could do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So, so when you talk about love, you're also talking about that which you're willing to sacrifice. So now, if we get back to the hadith, Allah will scan the heart. What's in your heart? Is it the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you claim, or is it something else? Um, what's uh, the common between between somebody who has hatred and somebody who is a mushrik. In their heart, there is no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The heart is not clean at all. And the mushrik, 
his heart is still decorated with everything but Allah. So how could he receive the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the other person is full of hatred. Hatred and love is basically the same feelings, emotions, just a switch is turned the other way around. So instead of directing hatred toward things that are the Sharia looks down upon, he's turning his hatred and his feelings and emotions uh, towards something that he should not be hating. But what does this mean? It means, you know, when we, we want to change, uh, and in, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah does not change the situation of people until they change what's in their hearts. But my heart is not under my control. My heart is under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how could I change my heart? Because my, the, the Qalb is called Qalb because it's always changing. You always change. It's like when somebody tells you, I love you, you think, oh, she loves me for until the end of life. No, she's saying, I love you at this moment, but five minutes later, I may hate you. And there is no contradiction between the two. Because it means, I love how you make me feel at this moment. When she hates you, she also hates how you make her feel at this moment. No contradiction. But we also know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, من أتاني يمشي أتيته هروا. So there is a step that we can take on our own. Even even a disbeliever can take this step, because the ayah in the Quran says, والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهديناهم سبلنا. Those who struggle and strive in our paths, we shall guide them to our paths. And the ulama said this applies to both Muslims and non-Muslims. And the minimum one can is to make a decision in the heart that I'm willing to accept the truth no matter where it comes from. Hmm? I.e., we always say, let's say we're, we're, there's a drought in California, and we say, where's water? I need water, I need water, I need water. And let's say it starts raining outside. And if you say, I want water, I want water, I want water, all you have to do is that you grab your bucket and go outside and pour it under the rain and you get water. So you have to make a step. Once you make a step, Allah will make 10 steps toward you, or 100 steps, or 1,000 steps. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a condition that we have to show a willingness to accept the truth. And this doesn't only apply to non-Muslims. Apply to Muslims, because when we are Muslims, we become stubborn. We think we're, we're now you know, on cloud nine or in paradise. No. It's always like that. Sometimes I accept the truth up to a certain point. Because what is our commitment? As Muslims, what are we are committed to the most? What do you think? What are we committed to the most? We are committed to the truth. This commitment we call Iman, because Allah is the truth, capital T. Hmm? That's our commitment. Everybody has commitment, whether one is an atheist, or a Christian, or a Jew, or a Muslim. People have commitment. The atheists have commitment toward materialism. They're committed to that. Other people have, committed, have commitment toward something. In your job, you must have commitments. What is it you're committed to the most? As Muslims, we're committed to the truth. To the truth. To the truth. Yeah, the truth, finding it, and then following it. Finding it is called Iman. That's the first thing. But to remain on Iman and not to be distracted and not our heart, you know, getting corrupted, that's not an easy task. It takes a lot of effort. But it's a straight path in a way. It's the yeah, that's the truth. Yeah. Our commitment, commitment is to Al-Haqq. Al-Haqq. Bikulli masadiqihi. Because the Sirat al-Mustaqim is just one of the elements of Haqq. Right? It's like you have a set and you have elements in the set. So these are examples of al-haq. And the opposite of haq is batil, falsehood. 
And sometimes we use metaphor. We say when the haq comes, kicks out the falsehood and you know, expels it out the door. It's like the falsehood is an entity and, 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 uh, and the truth comes and kicks it out. That's a metaphor to, uh, to make it understandable. So, in Allah, la yugayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayyiru ma bi anfusim. And this works both ways, huh? positively and negatively. So if you change your your heart, what's in your heart in a negative way, Allah leaves you alone. But if you make a decision in a positive direction, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also support you and present you with another option. Then you have to make another decision. Because you may say, I'm committed to the truth up to a certain point, but beyond, be, you know, beyond that point, I don't know. Maybe I will stay committed, maybe not. You know, the ulama asked, asked the question, can a person deceive himself? People can deceive themselves. All right, so let's, uh, we don't want to take much of your time. One last thing on the, on the shirt side. Yeah. Like You see, when the examples we heard before, yeah. they're all symptoms. What is the root cause? The root cause is that it's in here. That's where the root cause is. It's associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a manifestation of what's in the heart. But when you say, la ilaha illallah, it means la ilaha, la ilaha. I, I looked into my heart and I've cleaned it from anything worthy of being adored or worshipped. Except you. That's a minor shirk. That's a riyah. But then if you have that, is it wrong? Are you considered a shirk? No, it's a minor shirk. It's, it's something you have to work on. It's something you have to work on. We all fall into that. When I give donations to the mosque, I give donations only if the media is there and they're taking a picture of me. That's riyah. Show off. I'm, I'm showing off. Because these things, they... These things are psychological state. Um, the Prophet ﷺ was asked about those who go on military expeditions hamiyatan, just to defend the tribe. Or shaja'atan. They get intoxicated when people call them courageous. He said, and then he, he was asked, which of those are fi sabilillah? He said, من قاتل لتكون كلمة الله هي العليا فهو في سبيل الله. If you go on a military expedition to raise the word of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, that's for the sake of Allah. What does this mean? It means that's an intellectual decision. The other three, they're making an emotional decision. It's a psychological state that drove them to, uh, you know, to kick somebody just to show that he's courageous or to avenge someone because they've insulted the honor of the tribe or the honor of the family or my honor. Right? So those are in a nafsiya, nafsaniya. There's a difference between a nafsani decision and an intellectual decision. Intellectual decision, I thought, no. I want to deliver the message. I want to convey the message. I want to raise the... Uh, you know, that's an intellectual decision. That's not an emotional decision. That's different. So it says, now in the hadith, it talks about, uh, you know, those who are mushriks, those who, uh, so either their heart is completely corrupted or partially corrupted, like the one who has hatred. The hatred is, is, has taken firm in the heart and it needs to be uprooted before it is eligible for the mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this, this, you know, this, this shows that you know, all of us can fall into this. We are not immune from hating people. So if we want our, our records to be presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be forgiven, we have to work on 
yeah, lubricating that part and let it. Or at least, if you don't, maybe you don't want to, you, you don't have to become a friend with them, but don't hate them. Don't hate them. For your own sake. For your own sake. Yeah. You can have a business relationship with them. That's it. Some people, they do this with the Prophet. It's like the business relationship. Oh, Messenger of Allah, we're going to follow you. Instead of someone hugging the Prophet, he says, I'm willing to do anything for you. That's love. What is it you're willing to sacrifice? Hmm? For the sake of whom you love. Hmm? So, but then the hadith talks about uh, istighfar and maghfira. And Raghib al Aswahani, in his dictionary on the Quran, he said the word maghfira is, used to be a shield that the soldiers used to wear around the neck. Neck and so this is like like a metal shield, and it it protects the neck and the body from from arrows that that are being shot at you, or from bullets. So imagine the sins are like bullets; they're trying to harm you and kill you. And this maghfira, Allah subhanahu wa taala, cover you with to protect you from sins and forgive all your sins. The words of the hadith are really interesting. Each word has a meaning and has connotations. And understanding these words, inshallah, will, I hope, will, will help us appreciate uh, 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 the hadith and how to benefit from this hadith so that, inshallah, at least next year, we can be prepared. And this year, it's never too late. If, if there is any question or any comment or observation or something you wish to add, hello, Salam. We're here to learn. Just a question about Khalid bin Walid. You said only his main arm and legs or only certain legs that are defeated in any way. You said there are three. Which one are the three? Alexander is a great and like they're historical figures. Yeah. Historical figures, yeah. Yeah. One time the Prophet ﷺ was sleeping under a tree and a Bedouin came and he snatched the sword of Prophet ﷺ and, and then he, he woke him up. Woke him. He said, Ya Muhammad, man yamna'uka minni? He says, Oh Muhammad, who can protect you now from me? My, your sword is in my hand. <laughs> I can kill you anyone. And the Prophet says, Allah. And the sword fell from his hand. The Prophet took the sword and told them, Maniam now kaminni, who can protect you from me now? <laughs> he says, Ya Muhammad, kun ghayra, kun khayra akhiz. Be the best of those who, who are in control. He said, go. So then the person became Muslim. And so this shows that Prophet Sallam was not, you know, because uh, he could have he could have killed him if it was like the personal feelings. Uh, oh, you you were about to kill me, I'm going to kill you. It's not like that. Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wants people to, uh, because in our view, iman is life. Iman is life. Alam is life. Iman iman leads to eternal life in the hereafter. We want people to have eternal life and to have guidance. Uh, what's the benefit of people dying and going to hellfire? That's not what the Prophet ﷺ is about. Hmm? When does mercy can be called a mercy? A mercy is called a mercy if it is shamila and if it is... It, you see, I say... You need ten thousand dollars. You come to me. Yeah. Uh, you need to have an operation for your son or whatever. And I give you the ten thousand dollars a year from now. Is this mercy? It's not mercy because you didn't get it at the time you needed it. Hmm? Or you ask for ten thousand dollars, I give you a penny. Is this mercy? No. The mercy has to be enough to cover your needs at the right time, at the right moment, in the right place, 
That's what's mercy. And Alayhi Salatu Wasalam was sent to humanity at the right time, at the right moment. Because when a humanity, when he was sent to humanity, imagine an earthquake hitting California. When you have an earthquake, everything will be upside down. Everything will be in. You know. uh, so the same thing happened uh, to humanity. An earthquake hit humanity, but not a physical earthquake. It's a moral earthquake, it's a spiritual earthquake that have changed values. Values became upside down. The Arabs, they had good values and good morals, but they've taken them to extremes. So they were courageous, but they take courage to, to extreme. They had honor, they took honor to extreme. They, their honor was, was uh, 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 if they get a baby girl as uh, a baby daughter, they would consider this as dishonor. Huh? So they would bury the girls alive. Because they thought this is uh, against our honor. So they took honor to extreme. Ali salam was sent to put everything back in the right place. So after an earthquake, a huge effort has to be put to reconstruct everything and put everything in the right place. He put everything in the right place in terms of rulings, in terms of akhlaq, in terms of values, in terms of relationships, in terms of what's important, priorities, what's important, what's not important. And the degrees of priorities. So we as Muslims, we think, we're proud, we think that we have, we know our priorities. We know our priorities. Alayhi Salaam wa sallam explained to us our priorities. And we wish everyone would know these same priorities. Because it will help them. These priorities, they don't also help us in religion, but they also help, they can help us also in our work as professionals. No. What should our attitude be towards like groups of people? So we talked about like harboring animosity for an individual. What about like groups? Um, you know, it could be anyone. It could be another nation. It could be a particular association. And then well, attitude as well as like how we talk about them, like let's say on WhatsApp. Yeah, I mean, every question has a history behind it. And I'm not sure what you have in mind. But um, usually when, when one talk about a group, they're talking about an idea or some values that this group holds. Now, on the other hand, when you meet a person that belongs to that group, you will find that now you're meeting a person. Every person is different from another person. And, and you want to verify, you know, who is this person? What does he believe in? Is he, is he open-minded? Is he not open-minded? It's a completely different game. So talking about groups in general and then meeting people face-to-face, -face, it's... Uh, Anything we measure according to the guidance of guidance of the Sharia. So, so what do they promote? And then we can measure these values according to the values that the standards we know. We have we have a high standard. And nothing in life is going to be, uh, you know, in this world we don't have hellfire on earth. We don't have paradise on earth. It's going to be the truth. There are always pros and cons. But the cons may be more than the pros. And because of that, we're against the, pro, the cons. We're not against the pro. So that's the general answer. Uh, you know, if, it's a, if there's a specific situation, maybe we can talk about it. Any other comment or sisters? طيب إن شاء الله جزاكم الله خيرا